puts his hands down. The red flag down. The 2008 University Boat Race is away from absolute still at once to frenetic motion. The dash now for the stream is on. Bad mistake by Cambridge on about stroke five or six there, just someone on the bow side, the right-hand side as we look at it, just caught the water. He's given Oxford the first advantage, maybe one quarter of a length. A start with intent, certainly from Oxford, who have to take advantage of the first bend, which will be theirs. A huge instant trade on the energies of the oarsmen here. Urgent boat movement, immediate conversion of individual power into collective rhythm and efficiency. The demands over this first minute are substantial, but the advantages to be gained, Wayne, are potentially key. That's right. Barney Williams talked earlier about the first knockout point. We're going to be there within two or three minutes, and Oxford are doing exactly what they need to do if they want to use that to their favor. The bend is going to turn to the right, and they'll be able to put Cambridge behind them if they want to. So let's get down and hear from the Oxford Cox, Nick Brody. Good. That's it now. In the mouth. Coming up to 45th stroke. Best possible rhythm. Ready? Go! Very quickly now, the geography of the course, the particulars of the river demand quick thinking of these coxes. Rebecca Talbigan in the Cambridge boat. Stroke rate still unsustainably high as each boat seeks optimum position in terms of the stream. That is the fastest running water at the deepest point of the river, whilst also taking note of the contours. The first major bend comes up just about instantly and favours Oxford. Yeah, Oxford being warned now third time from the umpire. What they're trying to do is hold the straight line as long as possible and push Cambridge wide. Cambridge will try and cut in and uh, yeah, push Oxford tighter. But yeah, it's going to get tight here, it's going to get clashing. Both crews have found their rhythm, and both crews quite a good rhythm, but Oxford will just try and hold this straight line. And Oxford need to get a length clear if possibly they can, Wayne. That has got to be their target in the early part of the race. I think that's what they're trying to do. In just the next 30 seconds or a minute, they'll have the opportunity to turn right. That's where they need to push if they want to close the door on Cambridge. Likewise, Cambridge need to dig in if they want to stay in this race. This is a really key phase of the race. It is imperative for Oxford to maximise this advantage and give themselves something to cling on to when the whole thing switches round radically in favour of Cambridge in five or six minutes from now. Let's get down to the river now and hear from James Cracknell, who's right behind them, James. Well, Oxford, have, uh, although they didn't use, win a toss, have used the stage they got given incredibly well. They've just taken the Middlesex bend, and if they could use it to their advantage, they could just have enough to cross over, and then Cambridge are going to have to dig incredibly deep. Cambridge must hang on here. It's going to be one of those knockout opportunities for sure, because Cambridge, yes, they need to respond. Oxford are pushing hard, they've got the inside of the bend. It's probably worth about half a length advantage, the inside of that first bend, which means Cambridge are going to have to row the half a length quicker just to stay in touch. They're doing OK, they're coming around the bend now, but, yeah, it's nip and tuck at the moment. It's do or die in the next 30 seconds for Cambridge. They have told, been told by their coaching staff that they have a good turn of speed, a good burst that they can put in when they want to. Now is the time to put that in to stay in the race. They are past the Black Boy, they're up past Barn Elms on the Surrey side, they're past Craven Cottage. It was uh, in the vicinity of the mile post just before, just after, about four years ago, as so we hear from John Garrett again that there was last any really contentious action on the uh, river. Since then, we've had three exceptionally clean races. This one is, uh, is tight, the oars are in the vicinity of each other. Cambridge Cox, Rebecca Dabigan's called that big push now. She just called the push, the crew have responded, they've risen their stroke rate up to 36 strokes a minute, which is much higher than the Oxford crew. She realised she had to make a call, otherwise, if Oxford got one length to clear, they could move across legally. As it is, the umpires warning Oxford, pushed them back across to their side of the river, and Cambridge are hanging on. Time at the mile post, just uh, over four minutes, four minutes ten there for Oxford which is a way outside record time, but that's what you would anticipate on a ropey old day for the oarsmen. First of two significant straight stretches on the course here now, along Crabtree Reach. This is the approach to Hammersmith Bridge by when position on the water, each relative to the other, as we hear from the umpire again, and relative to the Surrey shore and relative to the stream will be telling. And if Cambridge can hang on now, then all the cards will be stacked in their favour on the Surrey side when we come to the Big Bend. And look how close they are to each other. 
It's a real ding-dong battle here now with the both crews pushing for the water that they want. Both crews being warned by the umpire because this bend will last now for about another 35, 45 seconds before it starts to swing around in Cambridge's favour. Cambridge did what they had to do about a minute ago. They really put the foot to the floor. I think they took about two seats back. They need to maintain that punchy rhythm, maintain the momentum, keep the nose in front, and very soon the course will turn round to the left and they'll have an advantage. There's the Oxford but Worley feeling every one of his 36 years now in the engine room, right up to Will England being urged on there by the Cox Nick Brody, who is as hungry, hungrier than anyone for victory here today. And the boats are more or less side by side still, about three miles still to row. Three merciless miles, a, a grueling exercise in steely harmony, so often privately rehearsed, but only once publicly performed. This starts to hurt now, it's around about here that the grand privilege of involvement in the boat race can start to feel a, a dubious privilege. We've just got ourselves at least another five minutes of race here. Cambridge have pulled back. Like we said, the bend is in their favor. Oxford have not managed to kill them off. This could get very interesting here in the next few minutes, particularly if it's rough on the other side of Hammersmith Bridge. I think Cambridge have done fantastically well there to hang on. They were within about a third of a length of losing touch, but that push that Rebecca called got them right back in the race. And now, in my mind, they're in the better rhythm. Oxford looking a little bit short and stabby. Cambridge have actually settled, I think, into the better rhythm. They're looking calm and relaxed and are now, I think, in the key position. Because for the next eight, nine minutes, the bend will be in Cambridge's favour, and I think they will keep inching back. And you saw the face there, the earnest face of Ryan Monaghan, the stroke, the late call-up stroke in the Cambridge boat, and he knows he is back in contention. It almost got away from the light blues over the first mile, but they've stayed with it, and they are right in it now. And the turning point comes once they are under Hammersmith Bridge, the fabled racing line here beneath the second lamppost on the left. That's right, that's the best course to steer. Good shots there of Ryan Monaghan in the stroke seat. He looked uncomfortable in the first couple minutes, I thought, when Oxford pushed out to a lead, put Cambridge under pressure, but now he's showing a very nice move, doing a very good job. We knew he was going to be one of the key things with the new guy coming into the hot seat, but he looks very calm and relaxed at this point. He knows he's got his crew in a good position, and I think Cambridge are starting to put their bows in front. Oxford, I think, are under pressure. They're having to rely on pushing over. They're trying to break the Cambridge rhythm. Cambridge can hold their line. I think, yeah, Oxford actually have got a better position on the river there. Cambridge have been shifted across a little bit too close to the Surrey Bank, so they need to hold their line now, use this rhythm, and keep inching away, make use of it while they've got it. Look at that bow for bow, a real race in the rain. Cambridge just about lead, and over the course of history, 80% of leaders at Hammersmith Bridge have got on to be winners. It certainly, though, isn't a given. Last year, Cambridge trailed here and powered round the outside to win. Indeed, three of the last six races have been won by the crew trailing at Hammersmith Bridge. There's almost nothing in it. I must admit, I don't agree with the calls from the umpire here. It's warning Cambridge, and in my mind, it's Oxford that are trying to pinch the bend. Cambridge just holding their genuine line. The other thing that's interesting here is, is how close it is. Cambridge have really kept themselves in it. Remember, this is one of the knockout points that Bonnie Williams talked about earlier. Cambridge now have to finish Oxford off in the next couple of minutes, or Oxford get the next bend. The direction of the race alters radically here. Suddenly the crews will turn southwest as opposed to northwest, so relative wind and water conditions alter here too. James Cracknell, are you noting any difference in the water, in the conditions? No, the water's pretty flat. They'll be pretty happy with, with the condition they've got as they come through. Hammersmith, Cambridge, put in a great burst just before Hammersmith, and have uh, really dug it deep. And, and Oxford really clipped a lot of water, and it's now them who are on the defensive, and they've got to dig deep. And to be honest, I didn't think, or, or sorry, they didn't think they'd be in this position, so they're going to have doubts starting to creep in their head. Cambridge are going to be feeling stronger and stronger and stronger. And the oars are pretty well interlinking. Let's get down in here from the Coxes. Nick Brody of Oxford. Here we go. Fabulous race. A fair bit of training time is spent on this part of the course. The bend does, of course, favour the Surrey side, but in pre-race fixtures here, both crews have shown good speed and have won around the outside of the Surrey bend. Yeah, interesting there. It was uh, Nick Brody calling for calm and patience, Rebecca calling for a big push again. Cambridge are going to push for 10, see if they can kill this Oxford fight off. They know they've got only a few minutes to do. 
Cambridge still have a nice snappy rhythm there. I still like how they look from the stern, but again, they've only got the next three minutes, two minutes to kill Oxford off. This is the heart of the race, the guts of the race. Fitness and adrenaline on one hand, just keeping going. Concentration and technique on the other. Togetherness, eight men attempting to move as one. Exhorted as they are over this stretch of the river by the great human overspill from the densely populated Hammersmith pubs. And more of the umpire's voice, and uh, he's voicing his displeasure about Cambridge's position on the whole. I must admit, I still disagree with his uh, decision. OK, around that bend, I think he was very harsh on the Cambridge. They were the ones tucked in on their station. It was Oxford that were trying to pinch the bend. I mean, yeah, OK, it could disrupt their rhythm. At the moment, they're still clashing. There's still the contacts very close there. And okay, we now get to the straight bit of the river before the bend, and the last bend starts to turn round into Oxford's favour. So, yeah, again, it's Cambridge that maybe need to keep that punch going. They probably used up a lot of energy in this in this first 11 minutes or so. And OK, they need to keep that rhythm and keep on going. Otherwise, Oxford will take the advantage again. Oxford have just thrown everything in there to keep themselves in the race, and look at that, they're leading now by maybe two men. This is not looking good for Cambridge all of a sudden. By now they've come up past St Paul's School. They have bypassed the little green island known as the Chiswick 8, and uh, a little way beyond that, the next of the major timing points, the uh, Chiswick Steps. And it would be a foolish man who uh, punted too much on who would win from here because one of the next key tactical maneuvers is crossing from one side of the river to the other now chaps how will they negotiate that and what will cambridge do from their position marginally behind now yeah i mean they again are going to have to dig deep we saw a caption a second ago where it showed that cambridge done already 12 13 strokes more than the oxford boat they've had to put the energy in to cope with that extra weight advantage of Oxford. Oxford have been very aggressive with the steering coming over very early here. If Cambridge actually managed to clash with them, it's Oxford's fault. So yeah, they're putting in the pressure, but yeah, okay, from now on, it will become Oxford's advantage. And so Cambridge do need to dig in once again, which is easy to say here, um, but for them, yeah, they've already been 12, 12 and a half minutes into the race, and it's gonna hurt, it's gonna hurt big time. Well, history and statistics make bleak reading now for the crew that trails, that is Cambridge. Almost always a lead now is a decisive lead. There is recent precedent to the contrary, but it is Cambridge's to chase now, because what remain of the contours of the race favour Oxford, who have the uh, greater part of a length lead now on which to cling. This is where, if anywhere on the river today, it will cut up rough. Because of the wind direction, we've actually been quite lucky because there's not many bits of the river that are so exposed as this bit coming up. So, yeah, it could start to get nasty. It could start to become that tricky technical contest that we talked about before the race. And at the moment, it's Oxford who have found their rhythm a bit better. And Cambridge is starting to wallow in the way. Yeah, you can see the psychology of the race has changed here. Oxford have got the bit between their teeth. They look determined, they look smooth. Cambridge, meanwhile, there's some heads going round, there's some doubt creeping in, and it could only get worse from here. Oxford moving smoothly, as one, the product of relentless daily rehearsal. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is not an act, but a habit. It was Aristotle who said that first, but a few uh, rowing coaches have repeated it, and it is utterly applicable now. These guys are indeed defining themselves here by what they have repeatedly done. And Oxford with their greater weight and greater height, and on the whole, greater pedigree, are moving away now, and it does look bleak for Cambridge, who stayed in the race, in fairness to them, longer, I think, chaps, than many anticipated they might. I think, actually, full credit to Cambridge in the early stages. I must admit, I always had Oxford down as favourites, but Cambridge put in a fantastic effort to stay with there and put Oxford under real pressure. Oxford are the ones looking ragged around Hammersmith Bridge. It was Oxford that were catching the water. Now, because they have the chance to be ahead, Oxford have been able to relax, they're able to kind of see the opposition. It's Cambridge that have to, again, try and make the kind of the, the tough moves as it were and it's them that are starting to make the mistakes and catch the water themselves okay let's get back down to the river and uh, hear from james cracknell james increasingly difficult now to make a case for cambridge yeah no, they hang on incredibly well they 
They toughed it out after three or four minutes when Oxford could have broken clear. Uh, they pushed hard round their bend. I thought the umpire was, was pretty unfair to them. But now they're going to be feeling more and more tired every stroke at Oxford. They're going to be feeling fresher and fresher. And I imagine there's a few calls in the Oxford boat telling them to, to punish Cambridge for, for last year's race. Big move, actually, by both Coxes here. We first saw Rebecca Dow being into the Cambridge. She moved for the inside of the bend for the calmer water. It was actually spotted by the Oxford crew, and they also have now moved in towards the inside, the Middlesex side of the river. I think Rebecca was taking a chance. She knows she's got to actually make a move, so she's gone for the calmer water and the shorter distance, and um, Oxford were able to respond that. It'd be interesting, because Nick Brody wouldn't have seen it himself, so he'd probably have had to have been the stroke man who had to report what was going on behind him, because both crews moved across. Cambridge first, Oxford then went to shut the door. Five minutes or so, perhaps slightly less to row now, Barnes Bridge comfortably in sight. After it, one more bend, offering advantage to Oxford, who have a substantial advantage already as they pass the bandstand. Past Duke's Meadow in pursuit of Barnes Bridge, and beyond that, the finish. And the result, in all honesty, now is uh, surely beyond dispute. And it is just pride now, and justified pride, Wayne, which is keeping Cambridge moving. Well, they did a fantastic job. I mean, they were considered big, big underdogs here. And if they'd won this race, it would have been probably the biggest upset in 20 years. As it was, I was pretty feeling pre pretty good about their chances at, at Hammersmith. And they really did throw everything in when they needed to. But I think here in the second half of the race, we've seen a big difference. Past the beautiful weeping willow trees, but they're not enjoying the scenery, those guys. It's a happier view for the Oxford oarsmen who can see Cambridge trailing in their way. Are there any remaining pitfalls, Tim, for Oxford? I mean, OK, we could look at the uh, look at the water conditions around the corner. We don't know what's going to greet the crew once they turn around this final bend. This, this Barnes Bridge corner is a very tight one, and if both crews were level, it's a real test of the Coxes. But at the moment, you have to say it's Oxford who have upped their game in the second half. It's, it's Cambridge that are struggling now because they put in so much effort to kind of stay on and hang on in the first half, but it's them that's starting to struggle. It's interesting here, both Coxes have really hugged the shore to get the good water, but according to boat race rules, they need to go through the center arch of Barnes Bridge, so they've had to pull back out into the middle of the river. Well, to shoot Barnes Bridge on boat race day is to clear the last at the National. It is the final hurdle, it's not quite the end of the challenge, there's still quite a run in. The final middle, Middlesex bend is uh, akin to the Aintree elbow, and in boat race history, there aren't too many Devon locks. Only six times in history, only once since the war, has the Barnes Bridge leader failed to win. Oxford came from behind this late in 2002. Cambridge haven't done it since 1921. And they're not about to do it now. The four-mile mark is roughly in line with the uh, Mortlake Brewery, which you can see there dominating the skyline on the Surrey side. And besides which, the ship pub offers a terrace from which to holler at the closing stages. We are heading now towards the last minute of the race. And Cambridge's bolt is shot. And it is going to be an Oxford year. I spoke to Wayne yesterday about the feelings you get coming around this last bend. Unfortunately, the only feeling I had from the boat race is being in second position. And this is a horrible time. You're digging deep, you're really trying, you haven't given up hope. But yeah, really, you know the race is, the race is lost. It's a horrible, long, long way from Barnes Bridge to the finish when you're not in front. And likewise, being in front, you get to, if you're in front, it's quite nice. You get to enjoy the... You know, the six months of hard work and, and see the other crew in your wake. It's not as interesting for the viewers, maybe, but it's exactly what the oarsmen want. Well, 21st century Oxford are never down for long. Beaten last year, but not bowed. Reformed, re-energized, re-stoked with the near-tangible self-belief, which is the hallmark of the modern Dark Mood crew. They are, in their own minds, rendering that one defeat no more than an historical blip. This will be three wins out of four, five wins in seven. The first decade of the new millennium is demonstrably theirs. Cambridge had hoped that 2007 would be a turning point, but once more, unresting though their preparation was, back-to-back -back victories have eluded them. Predominantly English and rightly proud of their approach, but disrupted in the days leading up to it. There has been a, a steeliness, though, about uh, Oxford this year. A togetherness and all-for-one, one-for-all desire as they see it to right some wrongs. 
in a political, sometimes rather fractious season for the event. The dark blues are getting their way. Yeah, you can see there why they were favorites. There's a lot of power coming down, good coordination, very smooth running of the boat. They're putting on a good display now. Meanwhile, with Cambridge in the back, you can see that the big efforts they put in early in the race are starting to tell. And an indication of the conditions through which they've had to battle the time. Bottom left of your screen, it's gone way past 20 minutes already. It's a long, long haul when you think that uh, this course has been covered in a little over 16 minutes, four minutes plus past the record time. Yes, I mean, think now, you, you feel good in front, but yeah, you've been working so hard for 20 minutes. It still have the physical effort, but the difference between crossing the line first and crossing the line second is huge. Man for man heavier, man for man on average older, man for man on the day quicker, and on the only day when it really matters, history will record that 2008 was Oxford's year, the year when the Dark Blues bit back. Relentlessly stubborn, imperturbably self-assured, moulded veteran and callow youth together into a unit which delivered on its one and only remit to win. And what an uplifting achievement that is for the individuals who have comprised that winning team for Nick Brody as Cambridge follow him home, nobly though they have tried. Nick Brody scarred by exclusion in 2006 by defeat in 2007, but healed by victory as president in 2008. Mike Worley, double Olympian, three-time world champion, but this was something different, that at 36 he becomes the oldest man, bar none, ever to win the boat race. Jan Herzog, another double Olympian, adds another special line to his CV. And at the other end of the scale, think what this means to the two young sons of Oxford, Ben Smith, and Ollie Moore, for whom it is the fulfilment of boyhood dreams. For Cambridge there, disconsolate, the gap in weight and perhaps experience was just too great to bridge. The loss through illness of their stroke, Shane O'Mara, just three days before the race, too disruptive to overcome, but rational explanation does not equate to consolation.